Real briefly, before I get started on this teaching, I would like to just summarize some of the things that have been said previously. Our first tape entitled, What is the Gospel?, was basically summarizing Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through Romans chapter 5. And in those verses, he began to start clarifying what the gospel was, that it was the power of God unto salvation. He was using gospel and grace interchangeably, and he begins to start showing that this whole performance mentality where people feel like they earn relationship with God through their holy acts is wrong thinking, that no one can ever be justified in the sight of God through the law. And he used the Old Testament law to prove that that never was the purpose of it. The Old Testament law was not for the purpose of justification, but rather it was actually to make sin come alive, to condemn us all under sin. He used Abraham and David as examples of this in Romans, the fourth chapter. In the fifth chapter, he began to summarize this, saying that it's only through the grace of God and putting faith in God's grace that we can have any peace with God at all. And he makes a number of illustrations there talking about how that sin entered into the world through one man, through Adam. And in the same way as we were born sinners, when you get born again, you are born righteous. It comes as a gift, not as something that you work for. And then on our second tape entitled, What is Holiness? Out of Romans chapter 6, we dealt with that there are two reasons, really, to live holy. Number one, it's not the nature of a Christian to live unholy anymore. Our nature has been changed and we are no longer driven and compelled by an old sin nature. The number two reason in Romans 6.16 is that if we do live in sin, even though God may not be imputing it unto us, it'll yield ourselves unto Satan, the author of that sin, and Satan will bring death and destruction into our life through yielding unto him. So two reasons for living holy. Number one, it's the nature of a Christian to live holy. Number two, it's an inroad of Satan into our life when we live unholy. So holiness is still important, but the motivation for holiness is totally different than a legalistic law mentality. The law mentality says you've got to be holy for God to accept you. Grace says that holiness, or a lack thereof, does not make God accept you more or reject you because of a lack of holiness. But holiness is good because it's your nature and because it keeps inroads of Satan into your life down. And then we contrasted Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8 in the third tape entitled The Spirit versus the Flesh. And we explained a lot of things in Romans chapter 7 about how that this is not describing the normal Christian life, just a life of frustration to where we can't do the good that we want to do. But rather Romans chapter 7 is giving us the picture of a person who is trying to serve God out of their own ability. It doesn't matter if it's a Christian or a non-Christian. The flesh, our self, is incapable of ever living the total victorious life that God intended for us to have. And so, in Romans chapter 8, it shows us the Spirit-filled life, a life where the Spirit of God is flowing through us. So Romans chapter 7 is showing the frustration of trying to serve God through our own ability, which goes right along with the point that Paul is making in this entire book, talking about a lack of self-reliance, self-salvation, self-righteousness. And rather, it's advocating a dependence upon God and just accepting righteousness, salvation as a gift through the gospel. And so that's what Paul is contrasting. Romans 7 is the self righteous person trying to earn it on their own. Romans chapter 8 is the person who has learned the power of the gospel and is letting the Spirit of God flow through him. So now we come to the last teaching in this in Romans chapter 9, and what we're going to be talking about here are two different types of righteousness. Of course, Paul is continuing this teaching on the grace of God, and he's, he's already made his point eloquently. I mean, it has been powerful. In Romans, the ninth chapter, he starts off by talking about how that he is longing for the salvation of his natural brothers, the Jewish nation. He longs for them so much so that he could even wish that he himself could be cursed, separated from God. If he could bear their sins, he would. Of course, there's no point in that. We might look at that and say, well, that's an admirable quality, but it really is no point because Jesus has already borne their sins. But see, they aren't accepting the forgiveness of Jesus because they are looking to earn it. 
And they aren't wanting it as a gift. They aren't wanting to come and be dependent upon Jesus, the Savior. They were trusting in their own goodness, their own righteousness to produce salvation. And so Paul laments that in Romans chapter 9. But then he begins to start saying, well, it's not a total loss because, see, a true Jew isn't just a physical, natural-born Jew, but it's the ones who are the true children of promise, those who walk with the faith of Abraham that are the true Jews. And again... That brings up some very offensive things to these religious people. In verse 30, let's go to Romans chapter 9, verse 30. He's kind of making a summary of the things that he said here in the book of Romans, and uh, these are powerful truths going on into the 10th chapter of Romans. In verse 30, he says, What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have obtained to righteousness even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Now again, to the religious mind that we have today, the terminology here is such that a lot of people just don't understand the radicalness of what Paul is saying. He's talking to religious people who were very zealous. He mentions that in the 10th chapter. Very, very zealous of the law. I mean, they are seeking God. Their whole life is built around seeking God. Their manner of dress is about seeking God. Their government is a theocracy. That's the way it was intended to be. Of course, at this time, the Romans were ruling over them. But basically, they had a theocracy rather than just some kind of a civil government to where God was actually involved in politics. Their politics centered around godly principles. Their dress was around this. Their food was dictated by religious laws. They had times that they prayed. Everybody stopped and prayed during the day. They had times that the people would stand on the street corner and pray aloud and blow trumpets in front of them. They were very strict about their giving and on and on and on it went. These were religious people. Their whole life was consumed with seeking God. And here Paul comes along saying that the Gentiles, which the term Gentiles here just means non-Jew, but it became synonymous with a pagan, talking about people who had no relationship with God, people who were indulging themselves. They weren't denying self. They were indulging self. These were just heatherners, the terminology we would use today. And basically he's saying that the heathen, which weren't even following after righteousness, they weren't seeking after God. They weren't trying to live holy. It says that they have obtained to righteousness even the righteousness which is of faith. Boy, this is a radical statement. And then you put this together with the next verse where he says, But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not obtained to the law of righteousness. Boy, this is a statement that just shook the religious people because he's saying these heathens out here that weren't even trying to live holy are more acceptable to God. They have become righteous and accepted with God, and you who was living holy are rejected by God. Boy, this is a statement that incensed people, I'm sure. This is the reason that Paul suffered persecution. And it's the reason that anyone who truly preaches the true gospel of God today still suffers persecution. This is very offensive to a religious person. In verse 32, he says, Wherefore, why? Why is this true? How could this be? He goes on to say, Because they sought it, speaking about the Jews, the religious Jews, sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. In other words, the reason that he's saying that the non-religious have become accepted with God and the religious have been rejected by God, the reason for that is because the religious were putting faith in all of their actions, in their own holiness. They were trusting in their righteousness, whereas the heathen, the people who weren't seeking after God, when they heard the gospel that salvation was just a gift and that they didn't have to earn it, Boy, those people embraced that. It was very beneficial to them because they knew that they hadn't been living a proper life. And when somebody came along and told them that God would accept them on the basis of grace as a gift, all they had to do was believe and receive Jesus as their Savior, what a deal. They went for that. The religious person rejected Jesus basically for the same reasons because the gospel was telling them that it wasn't their goodness that earned them relationship with God. It just came through Jesus as a gift. And the religious person was saying, well, this isn't fair. Look how hard I've worked. In a sense, see, it was against their own effort. It was like making the religious person say, you mean that all of my self-denial and all of my holiness 
doesn't make me any better than the person that had been living in sin. If God doesn't love me more, you mean that I've got to have the same degree of salvation as this old reprobate over there? And the pride of the religious person won't let them receive something like that. We see the exact same thing happening in our culture today. There are many, many, many religious people who are maybe doing some of the right things. It's not that what they're doing is wrong. It's the fact that they are putting their faith in their actions instead of receiving salvation as a gift. And it's very offensive to those people to hear the gospel preached that a person could not be living as holy as they are and yet receive from God better because they're putting faith in a Savior instead of earning it. That's offensive to a person who is trusting in themselves. I've actually been in churches before where some pillar of the church that is there every time the doors are open and they pray and they lead Sunday school class and they knit quilts and they bake pies and they're just always doing religious deeds and good things and they do all of this. Those people have some sickness or some financial need or some problem in their life that they've been struggling with for years and it just hasn't been meant. And then some drunk comes in off the street and this drunk has nothing to offer God. And somebody tells them the gospel that, hey, it's not according to who you are and how holy you are. You don't have to have a track record of holiness. Just receive from God as a gift. All you got to do is believe and God will move. And this old drunk, this reprobate, receives the same healing that dear old Saint so-and-so has been seeking for for 20 years. And the drunk gets it and they still don't have it. And you see them swell up with pride and say, it isn't fair, it isn't fair. But see, the truth is, we don't need justice, we need mercy. If we got what we deserved, even dear old Saint so-and-so, righteous, Sister Righteous, would still not receive from God because she doesn't deserve it if she's going to approach it on her own faith. Oh, she might deserve it more than I do, but all of us have sinned and come short of God's standard, Romans 3.23. So you see, trusting in ourself, the religious person who is relying in their own goodness is a hard person to reach. These are the ones that gave Paul the biggest problems. The religious people are the ones that crucified Jesus and persecuted the church. And it's still religious people today who come out against the true gospel. The hardest people to reach with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ are good people. When you preach the gospel to a person who is not living righteous, and if they really hear what you've got to say, boy, that is good news to them. And people respond to that positive message of the gospel. But if you take a religious person who is trusting in their goodness and they're proud of what they've accomplished and they feel they're better than somebody else because of their own effort, and you preach the gospel to them, barring a supernatural intervention of God, just revealing it to them and really convicting them, that religious person will always resist that. Because basically it's saying all of their great righteousness has been to no avail. And truly that's not correct because as we dealt with in our tape entitled Why Holiness, holiness is still beneficial to us because it denies Satan access to us and it helps us in our relationship with other people. But it is true that our holiness does not make us more acceptable with God nor does our lack of holiness make us less acceptable to God. Our relationship with God has to be based entirely upon faith. And our holiness is good to maintain in relationships with people, and it's good to use as a weapon against the devil to stop opportunity in your life, but it cannot be the basis of your relationship with God. So this is what Paul is referring to in verse 32. He says the reason they didn't receive uh, righteousness with God is because they sought it not by faith, but as it was by the works of the law. This term here, works of the law, is used five different times in the book of Romans, and it basically is referring to doing good things, but doing it with the wrong motive, trusting in what you have done instead of trusting in what God has done. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, and also 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, it talks about there a work of faith. So see, there can be works of faith or works of the law. A work of the law is when you're doing something. It doesn't matter if it's good or not. It's just that you are doing it with the mindset that this is going to earn you relationship with God. God owes it to you because look what I did. That's a work of the law. 
a work of faith may be the exact same action as a work of the law, but the mindset behind it is that I'm not doing this to earn relationship with God. I'm doing this because God has given me relationship. I love him and I want to serve him. Works of faith are motivated by faith and by love, not by sense of debt and obligation. So actually it's the motive behind it that makes the difference. And Paul is here saying that these Jews had the wrong motivation. They were doing the right things with the wrong motivation. And he goes on to say at the end of this 32nd verse that they stumbled at that stumbling stone. And then he quotes from Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 16. And he says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. This stumbling stone that he's talking about is Jesus. In other words, Jesus is planted right in the path of every single person. This truth of the gospel, that we cannot save ourselves, that we have to have a Savior, is something that God confronts every single person with. Some people, they respond to Jesus properly, and Jesus becomes their Savior and a wonderful, glorious thing in their life. Other people, if they try and maintain their own goodness, then they're going to stumble over this truth about the gospel. They will stumble over the grace of God. They won't receive the grace. They'll go on and try and maintain their own holiness, and that will be the very thing that causes them to fall flat of their face and literally fall into hell as they trip over Jesus as the Savior. You either accept that truth and it becomes liberating and life-giving, or if you deny it, it becomes damning. In chapter 10, he goes on to say, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He's repeating the same thing he said at the beginning of the ninth chapter. For I bear them record, talking about the Jews, that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now we're going to get into this in just a moment, but let me take a little sideline here and say that Paul is bearing witness that these Jews were very zealous for God, but it wasn't according to knowledge. In other words, he's saying that having the right knowledge is more important than having the right actions. These Jews were doing some great things. They were praying. They were paying tithes of mint and anise and cumin. You know, a Pharisee, a religious Jew, is a person that could be accepted into any modern-day church today. I mean, they're people that were prayer warriors. They were people that were there every time the doors were open. Very holy, very pious people. They always paid their tithes. That would get them into any church right there. Very few people would ever deny somebody like that. These Pharisees were very holy people, but Paul is saying that they have a zeal, but it's not according to knowledge. And because of it, they are not accepted with God. It's misdirected zeal, misdirected knowledge. And you know, there's a lot of people today, there's some false religions, some cults that are teaching it doesn't matter what you believe, just believe something. Reverend Sung Young Moon, I hate to even use the word reverend, but I'm really using that sarcastically in this situation. He's not truly to be revered in any form of the word, but this so-called Reverend Sung Young Moon in the Unification Church, one of their tenets is that there are many ways unto God. And it doesn't really matter what you believe. If you're a Buddhist, if you're a Hindu, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Christian, just let's all come together and it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something. See, that is in direct opposition to what Romans chapter 10 verse 2 is saying. Paul said that these Jews had a zeal for God. It wasn't just zeal. It was zeal for God, but it wasn't according to knowledge, and therefore it was not a saving knowledge. They were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. He says, you are believing the wrong thing. And then in verse 3, he goes into where the error was in their thinking. In verse 3, he says, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness... And going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now this verse shows that there are two different types of righteousness. That is a self-righteousness that we obtain based on our own actions. And then there is a righteousness that comes from God. And that is a gift. It's not something to be earned, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And so there are two ways to righteousness. Only one of those ways is the correct way. The only righteousness that will really put us in right standing with God, give us relationship with God, is the righteousness of God that is given to us as a gift. 
but most people are seeking after a righteousness that comes based on their own works, based on their own performance. And this is what Paul is saying about these Pharisees. He says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousnesses of God, which is by faith. Sad to say, just as in Paul's time, there are many, many people today that are ignorant of God's righteousness. Most people, when you use the word righteousness, they think about their own actions. They think about their own performance. When you use the word righteous, if a person was to stand up and say, well, I'm righteous, most people, instead of thinking about a born-again spirit that has had God's righteousness imputed, that means just given unto you, it's not earned, they don't think of that. Instead, if you were to stand up in church and say, I believe I'm righteous, most people would come and criticize you, especially if they knew that there was something that you had done wrong. See, they're looking on external. There are two different types of righteousness. There is a righteousness that you produce by your own actions. And then there is a righteousness that comes from God and it's given to you in your spirit. And this righteousness that comes as a gift is the only kind of righteousness that we can relate to God upon. Because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, or we could say the righteousness of God. Our righteousness is like a filthy rag in comparison to the righteousness that comes from God. This was said over in Isaiah chapter 64. It talks about all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. Self-righteousness compared to the righteousness that God gives is infinitely less. God's righteousness is infinitely more. And the Jews were ignorant of God's righteousness. Sad to say, most religious people today, they don't understand that we are made righteous. We don't become righteous gradually as we improve our actions. It's a gift. You are born again righteous. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30 or 31 there, it says that Jesus is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. When you get born again, God sends forth the spirit of his son into your heart and you become a born again person. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. And what's this new creature like, this new spirit on the inside of us? What's it like? According to 1 Corinthians 1.30, it is righteous. You have the righteousness of God imputed unto you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, God the Father, made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We don't have just a little bit of righteousness that came from God. Our born-again man is truly righteous. Ephesians 4.24 says, put on the new man. Talking about this new creation, the same thing that was spoken of in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You are created righteous. You don't become righteous through your own actions. You are created righteous. When you get born again, God gives you a righteous nature, a righteous spirit. You were given that. And the sad thing is most people are ignorant of this. They're ignorant of a spiritual righteousness. They're ignorant of a righteousness that comes as a gift from God. And what they're trying to do is to maintain a physical righteousness based on actions. And that can never be the basis of our relationship with God. See, Paul says it here that if you are ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish your own righteousness, then you have not submitted yourselves unto the righteousness of God. They're mutually exclusive. You cannot be trusting in righteousness as a gift through the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting in self-righteousness at the same time. You cannot be self-dependent and God-dependent at the same time. That just can't happen. A person who is trying to live a righteous life with the motive that this righteousness that I obtain, that I do, is going to earn me relationship with God. That person cannot be trusting the grace of God at the same time. You are either relying upon God's grace or you're relying upon yourself, but not a combination of the two. That's what it says in Romans chapter 11, verse 6. It says, for you are saved by grace without works, otherwise grace is no more grace, or else you're saved by works without grace, otherwise works is no more works. 
That's just old English for saying you're saved by either grace or works, but not by a combination of the two. See, there's a perversion of the gospel today. There are some people who will acknowledge some of the truths of the gospel. They will say, yes, you have to have a Savior. Yes, Jesus did die for you, etc. But then they try and pervert it by saying, you can't trust Jesus completely. You've also got to be holy. You've got to maintain a minimum standard of holiness, and then God makes up the difference. Well, see, Romans 11:6 is totally discrediting that. It's saying you're saved either by grace or by works, but not by a combination of the two. They do not mix. And so if you are not submitted unto God's righteousness, if you're trying to establish your own righteousness as the foundation of a relationship with God, then you are not submitted unto the righteousness of God. You have to be one way or the other. Now let me just put a little parenthesis in right here and say that is this advocating that people live in sin? We've already dealt with that in that second tape entitled Why Holiness? Of course, that is not what we're saying, and we've already dealt with this. There is a purpose for maintaining self-righteousness, your own actions of holiness. For instance, God receives you not based on self-righteousness. Your own actions have nothing to do with God's opinion towards you and God's mercy and grace. It's unmerited, undeserved. But you need to maintain a righteousness in your own personal actions when it comes to relationships with others. For instance, see, your employer doesn't hire you by grace. Your employer doesn't tell you that, hey, I understand that God loves you and I love you and I'm a grace employer. And so whether you ever show up for work or not, I want you to know that you got a guaranteed position. And whether you perform or not, I want you to know that you got a guaranteed position, cost of living raises, retirement, There's nothing that you can do that would make me fire you. You don't have to perform. It doesn't matter if you ever do anything. I just love you by grace. Well, you know that that's not the way that that is. God may treat you by grace, but I guarantee you, people relate to you based on performance. And so, as far as your experiences here in this life go, it is important that you perform well. If you've got a boss, you need to serve him, and he is going to relate to you and reward you based on your performance. Sad to say in marriage, marriage is going to be based on performance. It really shouldn't be. We ought to give God's unconditional love, but the truth is that you aren't living with Mr. or Mrs. Perfect yet, and until they are perfect, they're probably going to judge you based on your performance. And if you perform badly then you are going to suffer consequences of it. If you're going to school and if you don't do the work or if you don't do well on the test, you're going to suffer for it. If you don't perform well driving a car, you could suffer for it. It could kill you or it could kill somebody else. See, your actions do cost you something in relationship with other people. And, of course, Satan also takes advantage of your actions. We've already dealt with that in that second tape in this series. So it is important to maintain good actions, but it is vital that you never misunderstand the reason for holiness and actions that go along with holiness. The reason for those are because it helps you in your relationship with people, it shuts the door on Satan into your life, it keeps him out, but it is not the way that God looks at you. He does not look on the outward appearance. Instead, he looks on your heart. God is not dealing with you based on your outward actions of holiness or righteousness. He's dealing with you based on the inner qualities of who you are in Christ. He is dealing with you totally by grace. Boy, that's powerful. So yes, there's a purpose for godly actions, but you cannot put your faith in those godly actions. See, that's really the whole issue right here. Nobody's saying that a Christian should not be living holy. It's just a matter of where your faith is. Is your faith in your actions or is your faith in a Savior? If your faith is in a Savior, does that mean you won't have godly actions? No. As I said before, you'll live holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose if you truly understand and receive the gospel. It'll just flow out of you. The gospel will produce power in you to overcome sin and to live a holy life. But it'll be a fruit and not a root of salvation. In verse 4, he says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And the word end here means a lot of different things in the dictionary, but basically 
it's just talking about the termination. It means that the law no longer is serving this function. And I've already dealt with this quite a bit, but I want to remind you that the law never was given for the purpose of producing justification or righteousness with God. That wasn't the purpose of the law. The law was given rather to show us how completely separated from God we were. It was given to make that old sin nature rise up on the inside and show us its vileness so that sin through the commandment could become exceedingly sinful. In Romans chapter 7 it says that. So the law was not given for the purpose of righteousness. And through Christ that's now been revealed. Anybody who truly understands the gospel and what Jesus came to do recognizes that the law is now over for producing righteousness to everyone who will believe and receive righteousness as a gift. This might raise the question, well, was there ever anybody who was made righteous through the law? Yes, there was one person, and that's Jesus. Jesus came and fulfilled every precept of the law, and through doing that, he literally deserved total holiness, right standing with God. He had it by his very nature. He obtained it through his actions. So he had it by inheritance. He had it by conquest. He obtained right standing with God through every means available. The law to Jesus was a way to bring salvation, not only to him, but to everyone who would put faith in him. But he's the only one that ever kept the law. Nobody else has ever been justified by the law, and you aren't either. The law is not for the purpose of justification, and this verse makes it very clear. And then Paul begins to quote Old Testament scripture where Moses spoke about this. In verse 5 it says, For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. And we could spend a lot of time on this, but let me just sum this up by saying that in this verse it's talking about a person who is legalistic and is trusting in their own goodness as the foundation of relationship with God, is consumed with doing. This verse says that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. It's talking about here just like being on a treadmill. A person who begins to start thinking that they are justified with God through their actions. For a brief period of time, that may provide them with motivation and hope that, hey, I can live better than this and that God will accept me but it becomes a treadmill that you can't get off of. You know, once you're on a treadmill, you just can't stop. It's hard to get off those things. And see, this is the way it is. Once a person begins to start trusting in their own holiness, it puts you under this burden. It puts you under this pressure to perform. And regardless of how much you perform, you could have always performed better. And it's just frustration. This is the reason that Christians get burned out. Burnout is nothing more than just trying to produce everything through your own effort instead of trusting in God. Burnout is nothing more than legalism, whereas, you know, having the joy and the peace of God is trusting in the grace of God. This word that was translated live here in this fifth verse, it can mean a lot of different things, but in this context it literally means to continue to remain alive. In other words, you know, to live, you have to do certain things to continue to remain alive. Once a person starts trusting in justification through the law, then they just have to start feeding this thing. They have to always maintain this holiness that is just not natural. You are going to make mistakes, and when you do, you're going to bear the guilt and the punishment that goes along with it. You know, a person who is a legalist is basically a perfectionist. They're trying to perfect this flesh, and that is not the system that God set up. God established becoming righteous through just accepting it as a gift based on what Jesus has done, not based on our own performance. Well, those are powerful truths. In verse 6 it says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart. And this is again a quotation from Moses He says, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall ascend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Now this terminology here, this old English, is somewhat confusing. But basically what this is talking about is, what does true righteousness, the righteousness that comes from God, how does it speak? Or how does it talk? He just talked about that the righteousness which is of the law, a legalistic approach, is just consumed with doing. It's worked, worked, worked. It's a treadmill. It's tiring. It's frustrating. It's impossible. Nobody can keep it up. 
So how does the proper way of receiving righteousness with God speak? Well, it says things like this, that you don't have to say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. In other words, it's saying that you don't have to be so holy that you are like an angel walking here on earth. It's not you ascending into heaven through your own goodness. You don't have to climb that ladder of perfection and obtain unto heaven through your own works because, see, Christ came down to you from heaven. He's not demanding that you approach him in heaven. He's not demanding that you become perfect and live up to his standard. Instead, he came down to you, and he's offering it unto you as a gift. And in verse 7, it says, Or who shall ascend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. Verse 6 is saying you don't have to be so holy that you earn it your way to heaven. Christ came down for you. And verse 7 is saying you don't have to do so much penance that you go to hell and bear punishment for your own sins because Christ has already done that for you. Christ ascended into hell and he literally bore your separation from God so that you don't have to bear it. In other words, see, the point that he's making is that it's not your great holiness that earns you relationship with God. God came down for you. Instead of demanding you come up to him, he came down to you. And he's saying also it's not your own penance and remorse that earns you this holiness. You know, I've actually met people before that were under this deception of thinking that what Christ suffered for them wasn't enough. They had to also do penance. And I actually met a man in Arlington, Texas one time when I was ministering along these lines. He came up and showed me his elbows and his knees, and there were just these grotesque scars on them. And he said that he got those down in Mexico, actually during a feast one time, during uh, Easter time, where he crawled three miles over broken glass on his hands and knees to do penance. He told me that there were actually people who got on a cross and were either tied on there or some of them were actually crucified, trying to bear the sufferings of Jesus and relate to him and do penance for their sins. Well, most of us would say, well, that's foolish. There's no reason we have to do that. Jesus has already paid that for us. Well, I agree completely. But, you know, there are some more subtle ways that Satan tries to make us do the same thing. Sometimes we fail and we sin against God. And instead of just trusting forgiveness, trusting what the Scripture says, that, you know, we confess it, he's faithful and just to forgive it and to cleanse us, Instead of trusting what the Word says, many of us still feel like we have to do penance. We have to go through a period of a few days of bearing remorse and stuff until God will really forgive it. We have to go back and maybe spend an extra hour reading the Word or an extra hour praying, or we have to give a little extra in the offering to make up for the failure that we had. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with extra study, extra prayer, or extra giving. But I'm saying if your motivation is to do it as penance, then you are, in a sense, bringing Christ up from the dead. It's like he didn't go to hell and suffer your payment for you. You've got to suffer it. It's like double jeopardy. Jesus has already taken your punishment and borne it for you, and you don't have to bear it again. You don't have to add anything to it. And yet I would say it's probably human nature to think that certainly I've got to suffer something. It just makes sense. We're the ones that caused all of the grief. How could Jesus suffer all this for us? But the truth is that that is not what the gospel teaches. The gospel teaches that Jesus has already borne it for you. So see, you don't have to ascend into heaven through your own holiness. You don't have to go into hell through penance and remorse. All you got to do is just receive what God has already done in verse 8. It says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. In other words, you don't have to go up to heaven. You don't have to go to hell. So what do you do? You just simply confess the word of faith, that you put faith in Jesus as your Savior. And the next verse says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. See, it's not based on you being holy. This doesn't say that you have to be holy and do all of these things. It just says, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And, of course, this is more than just mouthing words. The terminology here, it says you have to confess the Lord Jesus. This is talking about a commitment, a reliance, an absolute total trust in Jesus as your Lord, as your Master. You're dependent upon Him. And then, if you will confess that with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. Boy, this is a tremendous passage of Scripture. And, again, this has become nearly a religious cliché.
We've become so familiar with this that we don't understand the importance of it. But the religious people that Paul was writing to, they understood the importance of it. This was totally contrary to the methods that they taught for salvation. They taught a rigorous schedule of holiness and observance of all of these rituals and laws. And it's just, you know, again, they were doing all of these things. It was just work, 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 performance, all of these things. And Paul comes along saying, all you have to do is just make Jesus your Lord and believe in your heart. He's alive from the dead and living in you and you're saved. In other words, you just receive it by faith. Boy, this was radical to the Jews of Jesus' day. And sad to say, it's still radical to a lot of people today. There's a lot of people that cannot believe that it's just faith in Jesus alone that produces salvation. They believe that they've also got to be holy. But that is not the point that Paul is making here. In verse 10, he says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In verse 10, see, he shows that it's the combination of heart belief and mouth confession. This really puts a different perspective on it. It's not just saying the words. We have a lot of people today that repeat what's called the sinner's prayer, and they say the right words. But if it's not coming from the heart of faith, then it's sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. It's not just mouthing the words. You have to believe it from your heart and then speak it with your mouth. It's a combination of the two. There has to be an outward profession, actions on your part, but it only works once there is a heartfelt faith. In verse 11 it says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And basically that's just talking about that you shall not be put to shame or you shall not make haste. And so this is talking about that when you truly believe from your heart that God will never disappoint you. God is faithful. If you confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart, you'll be saved. And remember our very first teaching here that this is not only talking about the initial born-again experience, this is also talking about healing. It's also talking about deliverance. It's also talking about prosperity or anything that comes as a result of what Jesus did. If you're needing healing in your body, all you got to do is confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart, and you will be healed. If you've done that and you haven't seen healing, it's because somehow or another there's a deficiency here in this faith. You need to just stay with the gospel. Meditate on these things. Understand that God has already done it. That you are dead unto sin. Therefore, dead unto sickness. Dead unto disease, etc. And you've already got it. And the moment you can really get a revelation of that and believe it and confess it with your mouth, it will happen. In verse 12, it says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. You could say between the religious zealot and between the heathen. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Those that don't have all of the great works, praise God, they still have the same access to God as those that have been holy. Now those that aren't living holy, I guarantee you, you're going to have more problems in the flesh than a person who's lived a good life. But as far as your relationship with God, your way to God is through faith in what Jesus has done. And if you can release faith in what Jesus has done, it doesn't matter if you've lived holy or not. You can still receive on the basis of what he has done for you. Verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says, Whosoever. And again, this is not talking about just forgiveness of sins, the initial born-again experience, but it's talking about any type of benefit that comes through what Jesus purchased for us. So, boy, the book of Romans here, this is just awesome. And Paul wound it up kind of by talking about two different types of righteousness. You know, scriptures that go along with this are over in Philippians chapter 3. And in those passages of scripture, Paul began in the first part of the chapter talking about, is anybody here trusting in their own righteousness, in their own goodness? He says, well, if you're trusting in your holiness... He said, I also could boast. And he begins to start listing all of his righteousness. He said that he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. That means, boy, number one. If anybody was ever a Hebrew, it was him. As touching the law of Pharisee, which is the elite, the people who were just consumed with all the legalistic practices. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. In other words, he proved that he had zeal. He went even to the point of persecuting people. 
touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He didn't say that he was sinless. He said he was blameless. In other words, he may not have kept every precept, but it certainly wasn't because he didn't try. He gave it everything he had. He was blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung that I may win Christ. Paul is saying, I had a standard of holiness that nobody could excel. Nobody was more zealous than I was, and yet he says, I give it all up for Christ, because the righteousness that comes through Jesus is infinitely greater than any righteousness he could ever obtain on his own. And he said in verse 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Boy, this is a powerful summary of see the exact same things he was saying over here in Romans chapter 9 and chapter 10. He gave up everything, all of his trust in his own goodness and holiness, so that he could be found in Christ, not with self-righteousness, but rather with a righteousness that came through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness that is given to us at salvation is infinitely greater than any righteousness we could ever obtain on our own. Because, see, regardless of how good we are, it's still limited. It's imperfect. But the righteousness which comes from God through faith is perfect. There is no unrighteousness. It is a perfect righteousness, the very righteousness of God. In verse 10, he says, "...that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might obtain unto the resurrection of the dead." And on and on he goes. Paul here was saying that he had a standard of righteousness that exceeded any of his critics, and yet it was no good. It wasn't producing peace in his life. He didn't have real joy and peace, rest in the Lord, until he quit trusting in himself and started trusting in God's righteousness. He said that this is the thing that was keeping the religious people from experiencing the peace with God was the fact that they were trusting in self. And by doing that, they weren't submitted unto the righteousness which came from God. You know, the truths that we've talked about here in this brief synopsis of the book of Romans, I believe, are truths that are still just as pertinent to us today as they were in the days of Paul. Our religious system today has gotten back into making people trust in their own goodness and in their own performance. And again, there's reasons for living holy and doing the right things, but it is not for the purpose of establishing a relationship with God. We can never be good enough to have God owe us right standing. He has to give it to us as a gift. Nobody is good enough to earn relationship with God through their performance. And the very fact that we are trusting in our own performance is the very reason that Satan is able to defeat us. See, Satan isn't coming to us and saying that God doesn't have power. That's not the point that he uses with people. It's not him criticizing God's ability. What he does is come and tell us, sure, God's got the ability, but he wouldn't use that power because you're so sorry. So it's not really an issue of whether God has the ability. It's about God's willingness to use his ability in our behalf. And the reason we doubt his willingness is because most of us think that God moves in our life proportional to our performance. We're under a law mentality. Oh, we may not be offering the sacrifices that were in the Old Testament. We may not be operating in circumcision and praying three times a day and doing those things, but we've still got the same mentality. It's like going down the same road, the same destination. We've just changed vehicles. The vehicles that are common today are that, well, you've got to be baptized a certain way. You've got to belong to a certain church. You've got to read your Bible an hour a day. You've got to be holy. You can't do this. You can't do that. You've got to have your dress a certain length. You can't wear makeup. You've got to have your hair piled on your head. You can't wear jewelry or God won't accept you. If you are basing God's acceptance of you upon any of your actions, any outward action, then you are not believing the gospel. You may not think it's law because it's not Jewish tradition, but it's still law mentality. It's the same thing, just substituted with different elements. And that is the very reason 
that so many people are frustrated today and not enjoying the peace and the victory that God brings. They haven't understood that salvation is just a gift. Instead of trying so hard to do all of these things, we just need to give up, run up the white flag, and just start trusting in salvation as a gift, receiving it by the mercy of God. When you do that, see, Satan can't condemn you. There is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. When we are in the Spirit, you don't experience the frustration that is there when we're trying to please God by our own effort, as described in Romans chapter 7. When we are allowing the Spirit, that born-again nature, to flow through us, and when we're serving God out of that born-again self, letting Christ live through us, as Paul talked about in Galatians 2.20, when we're doing that, there is a freedom, there is a liberty, there is a life that nothing can condemn, nothing can come against that. There is a level of victory that many Christians have not obtained to because they are still law-minded. They are still trying to please God on their own effort. And when they fail, then that's where Satan comes in and condemns them. And he's, he's not pointing to God and saying, God can't do it. He's pointing to us and saying, you sorry thing, God won't do it because of you. The gospel will dispel that deception. The gospel will bring us back to a place of recognizing that God hasn't had anybody qualified working for him yet, that God moves in our life because of mercy and grace, not because of justice. And I tell you, once you understand that, it will make the love of God abound in your heart more than ever before. And then like Galatians 5, 6 says, faith works by love. Once you understand the gospel, love comes. Once you understand love, faith comes. Because how could a person ever doubt God who loved us so much that he gave his son for us while we were still sinners. If that's so, then much more now that we're born again, even though we still aren't what we're supposed to be, much more now God loves us. If we could accept the greatest of all miracles, salvation, the born again experience, when we were a sinner separated from God, nothing good going for us. How much more, now that we've been born again, should we be able to see these small things like healings of cancer and deliverance from demons and and miracles of finances provided? Those things are small and insignificant compared to the initial born-again experience. If we could really understand that and start walking in this grace of God, our faith would abound, victory would follow, and we would find out that the gospel truly is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. You have to believe it. The gospel doesn't produce automatically. It's got to be mixed with faith. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says, The word preached unto them, talking about the Jews that came out of the land of Egypt, the word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. We've got to believe it. We've got to understand it first. We've got to know certain things, like it says in Romans chapter 6 verse 6, We've got to know it, but then once we understand it, we've got to believe it. And when we do that, then the word will profit us.